Hello there. Today I'm going to discuss calibration frames, how to create them, and uh, why we need them, basically. And why we need them, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what an astrophotography picture looks like with and without. And I think that'll answer the question as to why we need them. And uh, the differences may be startling. Wait till you see it at the end of the video. And we're going to start off with dark frames. And uh, dark frames are pretty easy to capture because all you have to do is put the cover on your camera so that everything is dark. And I would even place your camera in a dark room because I notice if it's in a light room or outside in the daytime, light will sneak into the camera. It, it, it does on my ZWO. It's done in the past on my DSLR. So make sure you're in a dark room when you capture them. The duration should be set for the same duration that you were using to capture your lights, and the lights being the stars and the nebula that you were capturing. So make sure if it's five minutes for your lights that you're doing five minute exposures for your darts. The ISO level or your for DSLRs or your gain and offset for CCD cameras should not be identical to your lights. Um, you could probably capture 15 to 20 dark frames um, but the more you go, I've heard, the better you go, but I think 20 is good in my case. And the camera temperature also needs to be the same as when you were capturing your light frames. And it's easy if you have a CCD where you can control the temperature on your camera. But if you have a DSLR, that's not, that's not so easy. You're going to have to capture your dark frames during the same time of day that you were capturing your lights, either right before or right after you finish your lights. That's what I've done in the past for DSLRs. And let me uh, scoot over here to PixInsight and just show you what um, one raw image for a dark frame looks like and what they look like when they're stacked together to make the master. Um, the one on the left is a single dark frame. Let's stretch it just so we can see inside. And the one on the right is our 15 to 20 stacked dark frames. And let's take a look at that. And uh, not a whole lot of difference. I, I assume the one on the right is better, but I don't see a whole lot of difference. And uh, that's, the, that's the end of part one on dark frames. Thanks for listening. I'll be back. Okay, now I want to discuss bias frames. And just like dark frames, you want to put the cover on the camera, and you want to be in a dark place. And the, the only difference, really, between darks and bias is that with the bias frames, you want to take the pictures at the fastest speed your camera can go. With my old DSLR, that was 1 over 4,000. Uh, with my current ZWO camera, uh, somebody else gave me this setting. It's... 0 0.000032, so that's what I use for my ZWO. Uh, for the ISO and gain or offset, you're going to use exactly the same settings you use to capture your light frames. And again, you want to capture uh, 15 to 20 exposures that will eventually buy, be stacked either by PixInsight or Deep Sky Stacker. And in this case, the camera temperature isn't really that important. It, it, it's not like uh, the dark frames where that one is important. So don't worry about camera temperature. And let's go into PixInsight and see what one raw image looks like for a bias. Oh, that's the master actually. I'm scratching these out. The one on the left is one raw image for a bias file and the one on the right is a group of bias files stacked together. So you can definitely see a difference um, with the master file that we really couldn't see that well for the dark master. So that's how those look. And next we'll move on to the flats. Okay, now I want to talk about flat frames. And flat frames, I admit, are the least fun of the bunch. And to start off, um, you want to leave your ISO gain or offset all the same as when you were capturing lights. And Unlike the bias and the dark frames, your camera needs to remain attached to the telescope in the exact rotation 
you don't want to touch the rotation, and you don't want to touch the focus. And while your camera is attached, you want to take off your dew shield. And I, I use the t-shirt method. That's what uh, my telescope looks like when I'm capturing flat frames. I take off the dew shield, I put on a t-shirt, and I wrap a rubber band around it to hold the t-shirt in place. And you want to you want to get rid of these creases. I can even see creases here, so I didn't really do a very good job in this example. You want to make the surface as smooth as possible. And next, you want to provide illumination. Some people point their telescope at a twilight sky. I actually prefer just using my iPad Pro because it's big enough to fit over the whole telescope. I just press it against it and I begin taking my exposures. And here's the interesting part now. Duration really makes a big difference in how your flats are going to turn out. And let me pull up an example of a flat, one raw image here. Now, this is an example of a flat frame for a hydrogen alpha filter. And let me pull up, I go into view, and I go into, oh, I think I already had pixel stats here. Oh, okay, there they are. Now, uh, Maxim DL will also tell you the same thing. Now, most people will tell you you're shooting for a mean readout of 20,000. I'm in the lower right-hand corner here. But 20 to 22,000 doesn't really work for me. I need to stay in the 3,500 range. And I've done this through trial and error. The higher I go, the more washed out my image becomes. The nebula begins to disappear on me. So... And uh, 3,500 definitely is where I need to be at. It may be different for you. Maybe you can go up to 20,000. Maybe you need to be at as low as 1,200. It, it just depends, and you're going to have to experiment with that. Now, it's interesting because each filter uh, requires a different setting for me to get to the 3,500. For example, if I'm on a luminance filter, I would have to use 0 0.2 to get me to that 3500 mean readout. Um, if I'm using my hydrogen alpha filter, I would set it for 0 0.9, and that would get me to 3500. Uh, if I'm using oxygen 3, I would go 0 0.35 to get me so to 3500. So each filter is going to require their own settings to get you to whatever value you need to get to. And of course, obviously, you're going to have to capture flats for each separate filter you're using if you're using a CCD monochrome camera. If it's for a, a DSLR camera, one set of flats will do for everything. And let's have a look at what um, one raw image will look like for your flat on the left. This is for the hydrogen alpha filter and a, a, a group of stack on the right. A group of stacked flats, that's what your final stack master flat will look like. And now let's start seeing the difference that calibration frames actually make. And it's, this is going to be interesting. I'll be right back. Open. Okay. The one on the left is a bunch of stacked luminance filters, <clears throat> stack luminance filters for the little dumbbell, and it includes um, the darts, the bias, and the flat frames. The one on the right is a is the same stack luminance file, but with no calibration frames. So let's stretch the first one with calibration frames. And that's what the little dumbbell looks like. You can see it in the center, and it looks like there's a little bit of vignetting on, in the upper right and the, the lower right. Now let's stretch the one with no calibration frames at all and you can see the vignetting all the way around. And that definitely doesn't look so good. But the big difference is when we run the automatic background extraction to remove the gradients. Let's run it now on the one with no calibration frames. We're going to go into process, background, automatic background extractor. 
and let's hit subtraction. It's already selected there. Okay, let's close that. And let's close that one. Now this is our file with no calibration frames. Now usually automatic background extraction when it removes the gradients, it's supposed to help. And that with no calibration frames looks like a train wreck. Um, you, you've got these huge circles, you've got dust donuts here, here, and here. Um, it, um, if you want to skip the automatic background distractor, that might be a good idea, but these problems are going to show up later in the process when you're trying to work through this file. Now, let's go to the one with calibration frames on the left here and do the automatic background extraction. Let's close the original and let's stretch that one. It looks very good. So you can definitely see how calibration frames have helped. The big netting that appeared in the upper right and the lower right is much better. Um, you see the dust donuts that were here, here, and here, and the, and the one without calibration frames don't even show up at all here. So you can see the image just looks way, way better. And I think the, the average readout of 3,500 for my flat frames, like I said, it works for me. If I had gone to a higher number, I already know from experience, it wouldn't look good at all. So you have to find what works for you. And that's my noisy clock going on in the background. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but hopefully not. But what I'm going to do right now, it goes off every hour. I should have known that was coming. But I'm going to show you one more thing because this is interesting. Let's just close these. Calibration frames made a big deal, were a big deal when using them with the luminance filter on my Schmidt Cassegrain. But let me show you what happened when I skipped them on my narrowband filters. I wish my clock would shut up. I gotta turn that off. Okay, now this was my Pac-Man image that I took a few days ago. And this first one is with calibration frames. I stretch that. And now the one on the right is with no calibration frames. Not that big a difference. The one on the left looks a little better. There's there's less big netting, but it's 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 not a lot. But now let's just do the automatic background extraction on these. Let's do the one with no calibration frames. Close that, close that. Now let's stretch it. Doesn't look too bad. Now let's do the automatic background extraction on the one with calibration frames. Close that and that. And stretch that one. Not a big difference. I found that very interesting. Now is it because I was using narrowband filters? That is narrowband just a lot, a lot more forgiving when you don't use calibration frames. Um, is it because I was using a Newtonian telescope this time as opposed to my Schmidt Cassegrain for the little dumbbell? I don't know, but calibration frames helped a little bit here on the left, but not a lot. So if you screw up your calibration frames when you're doing narrowband on a Newtonian, it's not the end of the world. You're going to be able to, to get through it. I, I just thought that was interesting. So anyway, I hope this little uh, video helped. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you later.